So I'd like to start if each of you could make an opening statement about why you're writing books like this, why you're speaking about this stuff, what is it that you care about that's on your mind that you want people to know that you are hoping someone who just starts watching this on video hears. What do you want to tell everyone that people that don't know you, haven't heard your story, what is the message that you would like to, people to hear from you? The lock mechanism. Great. How's that? Good? Thank you, Marcello. Uh, all right, well, first of all, uh, I'd like to take a very quick moment to, uh, on behalf of the panel, to extend our heartfelt gratitude to Stephen Shore and all of you. And yeah, uh, the, amount of, the amount of work to put something like this together is, is uh, unbelievable. And uh, more importantly, as his his visionary approach to life, to be able to bring something like this together, to orchestrate it, and, and whatever we will tell you about our mission, I'm sure that it would be echoed by, by uh, Steve Shore here. So our, our uh, congratulations on pulling this off and heartfelt gratitude to you. All right, so in, in, a, in an umbrella statement, I'm, I basically have researched for the past 40 years about this environmental food choice connection or environmental food choice sustainability nexus. And the only reason I'm doing it is because, I mean, I have a lot of other things that I can do with my life, but I felt that there was a large uh, need because it uh, obviously, it, for me, it's the, at that time, 40 years ago, it appeared to be as if the most important thing that uh, we could possibly pay, pay attention to. The difficulty was, and through the years, and it became more and more focused or concentrated, is, is that there is no one else really talking about this topic that's gaining enough momentum to create enough change to uh, ensure our not only sustainability, but what I call optimal sustainability or optimal relative sustainability, where we can all uh, thrive or flourish as a species with other species. So m my intent is to bring as much uh, change in the world as possible, uh, as quickly as possible, to make sure we stay within the timelines that are clearly in front of us or in the tipping points that we're, that we're faced on a daily basis um, through food choice, which is the easiest thing that we can possibly change, uh, knowing that all those other factors that are in front of us, such as fossil fuel and overpopulation and things like that. So that's my intent, is to how can we bring about the quickest change uh, possible in the most beneficial manner for not only our species, but all those other species that we share this planet with and future generations, because we're all interconnected. This working? About 14 years ago, I got curious about the optimal diet for humans. I didn't really have any particular health problems at the time that I knew of, except I later found out I was 20 pounds overweight. But So I, uh, I started studying the topic, and after mainly looking at, at what we should be eating for our health, and after about six months, I had concluded that we should be eating a whole food plant-based diet. Uh, after reading many authors, everyone from Atkins to Zone and everybody in between, I, I like the ones in between a lot more. And uh, then about six months after that, I, I read two books, one by John Robbins, Diet for a New America, and one by Howard Lyman, Mad Cowboy, over Memorial Day weekend in 2003. And after reading all they had to say about the environment, I'm thinking, oh my God, we're eating the wrong food. And so from that moment on, I've, I've been more of a big picture guy. I'm, I was trained as an industrial engineer and have had a long career in business as an executive. And so I was wanting to understand the big picture about what we're eating on a global basis. And in my first book, which was Healthy Eating, Healthy World, I I tried to tell the big picture that, that I had to read a hundred books to find, put it all in one book, 
Sometimes I get a one-star rating by saying, we've already read all that stuff before. Why do we need to read your book? And I said, well, it's for people who hadn't read it before. <laughs> so uh, my recent book I published with a medical doctor. And in the introduction, I said I had concluded that the most important topic in the history of humanity is our food choices in the 21st century. And that's because I think our future as a civilization and as a species is riding on those choices. And so now I'm trying to leverage all of my prior business and engineering skills to do what I can to make a difference in that arena. And I'm proud to be on this panel with these esteemed environmental experts tonight. Okay, I came into the study of agriculture and food uh, with a real concern for biodiversity loss and something that's uh, referred to as the sixth extinction spasm, which is starting to get a lot of traction now, but evolutionary biologists were talking about this two decades ago, and that um, the epicenter of biodiversity loss is in the tropics, and a lot of the blame for the biodiversity loss is with small farmers. And I started to study the problems from the perspective of small farmers, and and the more I dug into it, the more I realized that it, the problem is not small farmers, it's the inequality of landscapes that they're embedded in, and it's the broader political economic context that is, is the bigger driver of, of tropical deforestation. And so I became increasingly concerned with things like uh, land reform. And over time, it drew me outward in scale to issues around the global food economy. And that's my first book called The Global Food Economy, The Battle for the Future of Farming. And then from there, um, I began to pay increasing attention to what I refer to as the industrial grain oilseed livestock complex, which is a momentous force in the global food system. Um, the, the uh, grains and oil seeds that uh, go into animal feed occupy about a third of the world's arable land. And this is a large and growing dimension of, of world agriculture and food, and, and it's a very momentous part of um, dietary change, and, and something I refer to uh, as the meatification of diets. In 1960, the average person on Earth consumed 23 kilograms of meat per year in a world of about 3 billion people. Today, in a world of seven, over 7 billion people, the average person consumes 43 kilograms of meat. So more than doubling of the human population in about a half century, and the average person on Earth is consuming almost twice as much meat per year. And that projection from the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations is that it's going to continue. By 2050, the projection is the average person on Earth will be eating over 50 kilograms of meat per year in a world of 9.3 to 9.6 billion, depending on what estimate you accept. So this trajectory of meatification is, a, as I suggested, a momentous one. It's a momentous one for world hunger and, and very uneven command that uh, meat-heavy diets have on world grains and oil seeds and land and resources and water, uh, disproportionate r responsibility for climate change. And it has obviously huge implications for animal life. The driving force in this meatification is industrial livestock, overwhelmingly poultry and pigs. Though poultry and pigs alone account for over 70% of all animal flesh uh, produced. So this is something that um, is, uh, my, my interest in industrial livestock has grown uh, outwards from concern over the livelihoods of small farmers and, and into thinking about how this very big and growing dynamic of, of industrial grain and oilseed production and industrial livestock production uh, is, is such a momentous and, and very destructive force in world agriculture. That's a nice segue. Wow. I love the term meatification when I first read it in your book. I was like, oh, I wish I would have thought of that. It's, it's so brilliant and it really captures uh, the, the concept of what's happening globally. And uh, a lot of my work actually kind of takes off from there. Uh, when I was in grad school in the late 1990s, uh, a friend of mine, I had been vegetarian since 1989 for animal reasons, and a friend of a friend said, well, if you care about animals, you should be vegan. And I was like, vegan, what's that? And I was like, I... And so I got Dr. Clapper's tape. I love seeing Dr. Clapper because it was a cassette tape because it was that long ago. And uh, you know, I was like, oh, I got to research this because I'm not letting somebody come after my ice cream and pizza, you know, just 
just on somebody's word. So I, I listened to the tape, and um, during that time I was in grad school at George Washington University doing international relations. I wanted to you know, work in developing countries and help alleviate poverty. Hunger was my number one concern. Uh, and it had been you know, pretty much as long as I could remember. My mom's a social worker, and I was growing up during the 80s. The, the famine in Ethiopia still will choke me up when I, I think about it. And so as I began to research it, and I read uh, John Robbins' book and Francis Moore LaPay, and like a lot of people, I had thought, well, it's one thing for me to be vegetarian or for me to be vegan, but certainly I can't tell people who are hungry. I can't, you know, I, I wouldn't want to impose that on them. And I still don't, uh, but I learned that actually meat consumption in the high-income countries, in the U.S., in Europe, um, actually did contribute to global hunger. And that is not a secret. So it wasn't a secret to the, the vegetarian and vegan activist, and it wasn't a secret to the think tanks. And in 1999, the International Food Policy Research Institute uh, did their projection called Livestock to 2020, and they're um, going to be talking about, they coined the term the livestock revolution, which I'm sure you know about, and that term um, is talking about the doubling of meat consumption, and that's where they're saying meat consumption is going to double from uh, 2000 to 2050. And sometimes that's, uh, that range is shorter, sometimes it's a little bit longer, but basically this, this is happening on a global scale and it's causing all this harm, it's causing this resource depletion, and um, what are we going to do about all the land and water and crops it's going to take? And they say that, but then they, they refuse to say we should reduce consumption. They, they acknowledge that, it's, it's a, that people are going to want that. They call it the moral suasion of our well-meaning development partners. But they basically just brush it off and say it's demand-driven. This meat consumption is coming from lower and middle-income countries. So there also there's a blame game going on. And I'll be speaking about that uh, in more detail tomorrow at 11 AM. Um, but there's this blame game focused on um, Africa, China, India, because they're eating more and so that's where they want to focus on but they don't focus on the high levels of meat consumption the extreme levels of meat consumption happening in the US and high-income countries and they won't even put reduced consumption on the agenda so that was my main thing so instead of just uh, I, I was George Washington University is in Washington DC it's across the street from the World Bank that's where I thought I was gonna work uh, but then, of course, as I started to learn a little bit more about it, realized, you know, I was just going to become a cog in the wheel and not really be able to make a difference. And so that's when I started in on uh, the nonprofit world and, um, and really, uh, I probably wouldn't have gone to such an expensive grad school had I known I was going to end up in the nonprofit world. But anyway, it worked out all right. So. Um, uh, but I knew that that's when it all came together. So that's when the, the mission came together because being vegan in concept, it pulls it all together. So there's no real reason to not do it. It's better for the animals, it's better for the health, the environment, and now global hunger. And why weren't these powers that be at least having that on the agenda? So that was my main thing. I just want to get it on the agenda. Now, I would love to have a vegan world. If I could wave a magic wand, we would have a vegan world, but it has to be on the, the agenda. So being vegan is going to free up a lot of resources, put downward pressure on food prices, help the environment, uh, climate change. I mean, we, we could get into that over and over again, and I will be touching on that and doing some of the numbers tomorrow. But um, it has to be part of the solution. So a vegan world is not going to solve world hunger, but we're not going to solve world hunger without drastically decreasing meat consumption, especially in these really high income countries, and then trying to thwart it um, in the lower and middle income countries. Say, you know, don't use us as an example. Learn from our bad habits and, and uh, don't take that up. So that's in a nutshell. My main mission is to, to get it on the agenda, uh, a well-fed world at awfw.org is a hunger relief and animal protection organization. Uh, we do vegan feeding programs, and uh, so we do stuff that provides funding immediately to groups that are already doing vegan feeding and farming programs, and that's farming. We don't need animals for farming. Um, and also farm animal rescue, so helping at the grassroots level, giving immediate care, and then at the structural level here doing um, research, pulling together research that's already done and putting it in plain terms, and helping the general public understand better the meat connections with global hunger. It is very real. Um, it's not something if you say, the U.S., if we reduced our meat consumption by 10%, we'd have enough resources to feed the world's population. 
if you say that, just use it for scale because that's not how it works. It's not that easy, but there is real uh, tangible impact. So making that known to the activists, the social justice activists, the general public, and then also trying to get the policy makers on board. So that's what a well-fed world is about. That's my mission. Oh. <laughs> And, and for me, this all kind of started when I was a kid growing up in the Hollywood Hills. And um, I remember this, across the street from my parents, there was this beautiful oak tree that was cut down so a house could be made bigger. And it just bothered me to see this beautiful, natural thing torn down for this house, which was certainly not nearly as pretty. And then I remember a deer getting stuck in a neighbor's backyard, stuck in a chain link fence, and was killed because they were worried that they couldn't free the deer and somebody might get hurt doing it so the kill deer was killed. And I thought, we human beings cause a lot of harm to nature and to other animals. And I didn't want to be part of that. I wanted to live in a way that was not causing so much harm. And growing up, I was encouraged to you know, get a regular job and um, you know, just basically become what I thought would be a cog in a wheel supporting a system I didn't want to support. So in high school and college, I started volunteering with human rights organizations, environmental organizations, um, and as time went and I learned about factory farming and animal agriculture and the harms it causes, uh, I felt that this was an issue that was not getting the attention it needed. So in 1985, I went vegan. In 1986, I co-founded Farm Sanctuary. I started investigating farms to see firsthand what was happening. I felt it was important to have that kind of firsthand account of the reality. And we started finding living animals just thrown in trash cans or on piles of dead animals. So we started rescuing them. And now we care for these animals at farm sanctuaries facilities in New York, in California. And what really inspires me is my belief that most people are humane and most people don't want to support cruelty. And if given the proper information and tools and social constructs, I think most people are going to want to make choices that are not going to support animal exploitation and slaughter. And I think also, also most people would rather eat food that is healthy and nourishing and would rather support an agricultural system that's not destroying the planet like our current animal-based agricultural system is. So I believe most people, when seeing these issues and given the proper tools and support and when we also can create the social structures around those um, we'll start making the right choices and and i feel that it's critically important especially now with projections that have been mentioned here that human beings are going to be eating more and more animal foods um, i hope that we can prevent that from happening and i think we need to prevent that from happening I also agree with the point that countries that have been consuming animal foods in huge quantities for a long time really need to get their act together. And we also need to work internationally, but here in the US, we really have a long way to go to set a better example. And I agree with what Don said about, um, or maybe it was Tony said, about learning from the mistakes we've made. And instead of us trying to impose this kind of a food system around the world, as many uh, multinational corporations try to do. Um, I think it's important for us to look at these problems clearly and not repeat the mistakes, not create more of the same destruction and unnecessary illness. And we have made a lot of mistakes, and it's important to look at that. And unfortunately, what happens, though, when there are problems recognized, say with tobacco in this country, rather than saying, wait a sec, we shouldn't be pushing this tobacco, they go international, <laughs> where there are laws where they can get away with it. Same thing with pharmaceuticals or pesticides. If they can't sell them here, we'll sell them somewhere else. So that's a concern I have. And um, anyway, I think most people want to do well. Most po people want to live well. Uh, and if we can create the right circumstances and the information, people will start doing that. So that's what I'm optimistic about. Um, I've been a journalist for about 30 years, and for maybe the last 15 years, I've become an investigative journalism journalist, which I, I, is my favorite form of journalism. Uh, I like to investigate. I like to uh, uh, muckrake, if you will. 
And one of our favorite topics, of course, is corporate malfeasance, otherwise known as companies behaving very, very badly. And what I came to learn uh, in doing research for my book, Animal Factory, was it is the corporate structure of our food industry that influences so much that happens in our country. And of course, it's the nexus of corporate power and government, whether it's through lobbyists, whether it's through co campaign contributions, the way that corporations purchase power, not only in Washington, but in every state capital and indeed in every county in this country when it comes to agriculture. Um, but what I really like to do is write about people. I think people like to read about people. And it's very good and important to write in the abstract, to write about problems that are facing the world. But what I like to do is bring it right down to the granular level. How does this impact everyday human lives? And that's the approach I took in my book, Animal Factory. <clears throat> I went all over the country and I interviewed people who lived in rural areas who were mostly traditional sustainable farmers. And these factory farms moved into their communities and turned their lives upside down. Their water was polluted, their wells were polluted, the air became so contaminated they couldn't go outside most of the time. Their property values tumbled. Uh, their lives became hell because a corporation decided it was going to place this facility within a mile, half a mile of their homes. And the impact on these people's lives was so severe that to me that was a very compelling story. Now yes, factory farms pollute the environment, they kill wildlife, they harm the animals that they're raising. Animal welfare is a hugely important factor to me. But we also forget about the impact directly it has on people. And to me, nothing is more important than people, even though I, I love animals. <clears throat> so I wrote my book from, from that point of view. And when I started writing it, when I started researching it, I honestly believed that my eggs came from Far Farmer Brown <laughs> uh, up the road with little chickens scratching around in the dirt. I had no idea how our food was produced. And it was a shocking revelation for me to find out that virtually, I think is 99% of our animal protein comes from these animal factory settings. Um, and once you establish that problem, corporate power, corporate influence, overriding government policy at the expense of the average citizen, uh, you realize that we're at a crisis point. And the other thing that investigative journalists like to do is not only point to the problems, but try to point to some of the solutions, some of the resolutions that maybe, again, ordinary people can take to influence their government to rein in these excesses and these abuses. Um, I would say that I personally have come a long way. Uh, I am not a vegan yet, <laughs> yet. <laughs> but I'm, I'm, I'm on the path. <laughs> and um, I, I, I greatly admire people who are because they do it for all the right reasons, uh, not just their personal health, but animal welfare, the impact on the environment, et cetera. And I just, I think we are um, in this election year, uh, without taking sides one way or the other, I'm not particularly fond of either candidate, as I think probably a lot of people feel the same. Um, but we could go one way or the other here. And, and I think it's just incredibly important to take a stand. Um, I wrote for the New York Times for a number of years. And when you write for a newspaper like the Times, you are not allowed to have an opinion. You do not put yourself in. You take every measure you can to put yourself out of the story. And the beauty of writing a book, once you're an author, you're not only allowed to have a point of view, you're expected to have a point of view. And it's given me a lot more freedom and liberty to really talk about what I think. And what I think is that we do need to rein in the corporations. We do need to have the government on our side, not on their side. And unless we stop what's going on, it could be too late. I mean, we are heading down a road to environmental disaster. Uh, with this industrial animal production that we have. It's not good for the animals, it's not good for the environment, and it's not good for our health, whether it's communicable diseases, whether it's uh, respiratory illnesses that come out of these large lagoons, or whether it's the actual food that we eat, whether you eat animal products or not. Um, sustainably raised animals produce a healthier food product than uh, industrial raised animals. So I just, um, 
I'm very honored to be here, and uh, I'm very happy as a journalist that I do get to take a position and a point of view, and my point of view is that industrial animal agriculture uh, is an idea whose time has come to, uh, to get rid of, because uh, we don't need that much meat. Meat is underpriced in this country, and there are far more sustainable, humane, uh, and even economically beneficial ways to raise food than the way we're doing it now. Okay, if each of you would take two minutes and be specific about one result from eating animal products that you want to speak about. So let's talk about six different things. We'll just go one, one thing, and if a person mentions one thing, then the next person mentions something else. And each of you take one specific aspect from the consumption of animal products that you would like to address and make sure we're all completely aware is happening. Can we go first? Sure. Yeah, sure. I think it's a great idea. First of all, I think if I don't do anything else uh, by being here tonight, I think I'd like to make the point that, uh, and I, I appreciate everyone's opinion, uh, I think that I'd like to make it very clear that because of the recognized planetary boundaries that we've already surpassed, and because of the all aspects cumulatively combined, in other words, of uh, global depletion, all those aspects of our unsustainability. I'd like to make the point that the path toward our sustainability, which I would like to call again more optimal sustainability, it's not just to survive, it's to thrive and to flourish, given the timelines that we're on, is not an unnecessary path from point A, which is consuming animals indiscriminately, to point B, which is fully more optimally sustained, relatively sustainable systems, which are fully whole food plant-based systems agriculturally. It's not going through the middle point, which is from industrial farms to grass-fed operations. Uh, in many ways, on many levels, grass-fed operations, which are getting away from industrial farms, are m less sustainable whether it's talking about land use inefficiencies, fresh water use inefficiencies, the production of greenhouse gas emissions, the loss of biodiversity, higher feed conversion ratios. For all those aspects, we do not have time to move from the point of indiscriminate eating of animals with industrial methods and grass-fed methods in the world uh, to go through that unnecessary path of eating less meat. And I can safely say after the last two years, of spending hours and hours and hours on in think tanks and with some of the, uh, the most highly reputable scientists at Cambridge and Oxford and world leaders and conservation groups, uh, this path towards eating less meat but making it seem to be sustainable, when in fact, in an optimally relative sense, it's not, factually, uh, is, is not gonna work and that's, we don't have, we don't have the time to do that, so there's got to be a fine line of how we of how we don't scare people necessarily into some type of unnecessary reaction, but we have to make it very clear about the timelines and the proper path, which is which is not giving somebody a route to a, a less sustainable uh, path toward grass-fed uh, systems, whether you want to call them regenitarians or centropic agriculture or agroforestry with uh, various forms of, of uh, livestock. It really doesn't matter whether it's in the developing world or developed world, and that's another thing that's part of this is that the other aspect is that, right, our decisions that are made in the developed world are powering those, uh, those uh, systems in the developed world. And so anyway, if there's anything that I could drive home, that, that's it. My comment on that topic is about climate change. Um, in 2009, the UN came out with a report called Livestock's Long Shadow, and they reported that climate, that uh, livestock accounted for 18 percent of greenhouse gases produced by humans. And that was about 30 percent more than all of transportation combined, cars, trucks, buses, airplanes, everything. 
And that's a big number. And, and, and knowing we can change what we eat, we, we certainly can't get rid of automobiles and everything since most people in the developing world are just starting to drive for the first time. So that caught my attention. And then um, in 2009, two researchers from the World Bank uh, did a study and investigated a lot of factors that the UN people did not investigate. Their conclusion was that livestock account for at least 51 percent of all uh, global warming caused by humans. And at least 51 percent means it's livestock's causing more than everything else put together. So that, that really caught my attention. Now, of course, a lot of people disagreed. People in the animal food industry disagreed with that 51% number. And of course, the uh, FAO actually reduced their 18% number to 14. But whether you think it's 14, 18, 51, or 30, or 40, whatever it is, I contend that changing what we eat is about the only primary of driver of climate change that can be changed, that's even possible to change. Those same um, researchers from the World Bank, um, Goodland, Robert Goodland, shortly before his death in 2013, he said that the only remaining pragmatic way, he, he, by the way, he was the first environmentalist hired by the World Bank, spent a career of 23 years there, he was not a, a vegan food kind of guy. He was just a, a scientist that cared about doing the right thing for the world. And he said the only remaining pragmatic way to stop climate change is for us to replace 50% of all of our meat, meat calories with plant-based calories and do it very quickly because at the time, scientists were projecting that that the tipping point for climate change would be hit between 2016 and 2020. So I, I believe that climate change is that one huge elephant in the room that exacerbates all of the other environmental issues and therefore that by far is number one in my mind when I think about our need to convince the world to, to start moving in the other direction in terms of what we eat. Okay, last time I started with biodiversity and, and then moved into some discussion of dietary change. This time I'm going to move in the reverse direction. So that trajectory of meatification that I was talking about, if it, right now um, the average person on earth consuming about 43 kilograms of meat per year by 2050 projected to be over 50 kilograms. If that increase does indeed materialize, that will uh, represent, or not represent, will be driven by almost entirely industrial livestock, that's the projection, and almost entirely industrial poultry and, and pigs. That will involve about 50 billion more animals killed for food every year. Uh, we could part, again, because poultry is so central. Right now, there's over 70 billion animals killed for food every year. In 1960, there was about 8 billion killed for food. Now it's well over 70. And I have a new paper that just came out called uh, Towards 120 Billion. And this dietary trajectory that I'm talking about, that's the trajectory we're on. By 2050, there will be 120 billion animals killed for food every year if meatification continues. So this is, uh, again, the, the, the story of animal lives. And those lives are increasingly confined and miserable and full of suffering um, and violence. Now, moving back the other way to biodiversity. There's a lot of research now in conservation biology that suggests the, the crisis of biodiversity is even deeper than the extinction spasm. So I'd mentioned the sixth extinction spasm, which there's overwhelming evidence that we're now losing species at a rate that far exceeds the background rate, which is um, the, the, what the term spasm uh, is, is meant to connote. And now there's this, a, a term that's growing in conservation biology that's called defaunation. That's saying, yes, extinctions are uh, happening at a very drastic rate, extinctions and vulnerability to uh, varying scales of uh, extinction risk. 
But even deeper than that is the loss of animal life and ecosystems. So there is many non-threatened species, non-endangered species that are suffering drastic collapses across a whole range of ecosystems. And there's a whole body of uh, literature that, that documents these empirical trends of animal, uh, the defaunation trends of declining animal populations across a whole range of world ecosystems. And so the defaunation, I give this term um, following another conservation biologist, the landscape of ghosts. La landscapes are being, uh, lo losing their animal populations. Uh, and again, so, so a, a way of understanding the loss of biodiversity that runs even deeper than extinction risk. And the parallel to that ghosts is that we have exploding populations of animals. And exploding populations of animals in everyday lives, people are consuming them in greater volumes than ever before but they're vanishing from their lives they're in many ways, their consciousness, their connection to animals, their ability to see them. Like uh, David was uh, mentioning, 98% of livestock uh, production in, in North America comes from factories. People don't see the animals, they don't understand how they live. Uh, and so there's this growth of animal lives at the same time as there's this physical and, and psychosocial distancing that's happening. And so I use this term things, the animals are becoming things in the sense of moving towards pure and pure, and pure living uh, commodities. So this ghosts and things I think are two uh, major trajectories of animal life on earth. And I think, and this is one of the things I spent a lot of time working on, is the huge command that animal agriculture has over the, the world's land area, both as in pasture and also in terms of arable land. Uh, is, a, is a huge force in biodiversity loss. And so the, the landscape's filled with things, not just the, what I call these islands of concentrated animals that are hidden from sight, but the, the fact that they command these huge oceans of monocultures. There's those landscapes and then also the huge area of pasture, which is much bigger than cropland on a world scale. Those landscapes, I, I think, uh, again, I think that this is a very, momentous part of, of the traje trajectory of environmental change on Earth is these landscapes of, of expanding landscapes of things that are hidden from sight, uh, animals commodified, and then the landscapes that are being depopulated of, of other species, the landscapes of ghosts. So we have a mixed audience of people who are relatively new to these subjects and then people who are quite advanced, and I'm going to try to address both of that. Um, so I just want to start off with the fact that animals eat much more food than they produce. And to just start right there, so if that's new, especially to maybe our video audience, that animals eat much more food than they produce. So when we're talking about 70 billion plus animals being raised and killed annually, for food, that's just land animals, that doesn't include the aquatic animals, which are counted in the trillions. That is consuming a vast amount of our global resources, that's where we're getting the land use, uh, we're getting massive deforestation, and we are, we need to think about, if we had a, a hamburger patty that's 100 calories, that hamburger patty could be more than a thousand calories worth of crops consumed to, to feed that cow. And if I would like to really, if I would say one of the things I want to talk about is talk about the, uh, the real truth about numbers. So this is the real truth about food conference. I would like to talk about the real truth about numbers because as staggering as the numbers that we talk about here are, a lot of times we are actually using the more conservative numbers. So again, when we're talking 70 billion animals, that doesn't even include the trillions of, of um, aquatic animals. When you're hearing numbers about the 18% and 14% and 50% for the methane emissions, those are incredible numbers, but th even those could still be conservative. So one of the reasons that um, the 51% number, that was a remake of the, the 2006 UN report that they did. So they actually took their own statistics and they counted things that weren't counted, but one of the most important things in my mind that they did, maybe not fully, but just a very staggering thing, is that that UN report did their span. They, their numbers were over a 100-year time period. 
And like we were saying, we don't have 100 years. We can't count over 100 years. Methane uh, over a 100-year time period is about 20 to 25 times stronger, more powerful of a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. When you shrink that to a 20-year period, that number jumps to 84 times. It was 72. If you've heard 72, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has now increased it to 84. 84 times more powerful of a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. If you shrink that to five years, it becomes 100 times more powerful of a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. So while carbon dioxide takes up more space, there's about five times more carbon dioxide molecules in the air than methane. Methane at, over a five-year time period is 100 times more powerful, so it's 20 times more powerful. So we would, I would love to get to the real truth about numbers. And again, we have to lean conservative sometime. But when we have time to break those numbers down, to really do it. And I know we're not supposed to repeat, but I'm going to repeat um, uh, Dr. Oppenlander's um, grass-fed. Uh, so a lot of people think grass-fed is the answer, or humane, less cruel meat. Uh, no such thing as humane meat, uh, first off, but grass-fed is not eco-friendly. When you are grass-feeding cows, their methane production actually triples to quadruples. Grass-fed is not eco-friendly. Let me say it again. Grass-fed, eating, cows eating grass, because they are a ruminant animal, they have a four-chamber stomach, when they're eating grass, their methane production just naturally increases three to four times the amount is if they're grain fed. So I don't want that used as an excuse to factory farm them because then there's a lot of energy inputs and then they're using crops and monocultures and deforestation. So when you hear about the massive monocultures and deforestation going on in, in Brazil and other places, you also just remember that the one big thing we have to fight greenhouse gases most of our work is trying to reduce our emissions and try to bring less greenhouse gases into the world. Our main tool for fighting greenhouse gases is photosynthesis. And for that, we have to reforest. Instead, we're deforesting. So we're, we're, we're clearing out the forest. We're putting their cows there. They're emitting all this methane. Then we're losing our photosynthesis for crops, for factory farming. So factory far uh, um, greenhouse um, grass-fed beef is not eco-friendly. And um, every time we eat meat, again, because of it, it, how much it takes, because it takes its unfair share. So I want you to think of meat as a form of waste, meat as a form of overconsumption, meat as a form of redistribution. Anytime we're eating meat, we are, think of us as outbidding the world's poorest of the poor. We have low-income countries, people with, where starvation and hunger and hunger-related causes are exporting food to be used as feed, or they're actually the uh, animal products themselves directly, while their own people are starving. This happened in Ethiopia during the famine. It continues to happen. It is standard operating procedure. So every time somebody's eating that hamburger, they are eating grains that could be used. So it's the, the prices, but then also literally just bidding away from the poorest of the poor. So reforest and um, just really think about what the, the actual crop um, caloric content of your food is. It's not just how many calories. Think about what the crop cost actually is. Oh, come on. Yeah, I know, my friend. OK, I know. It was my fault. It was my fault. Humanefacts.org has more on this. Humanefacts.org. You know, I'll just follow up by saying that a lot of the facts are, or or there, there's, it's very clear that this is an inefficient, harmful system using an enormous amount of resources that could be used much more wisely to feed far more people. So why are we doing it? It doesn't make any sense. It's completely irrational. So I think the main point I want to make is that human beings oftentimes act irrationally. We're primarily emotional. And that can be okay, but it's also important for us to look at reality and try to make reasonable decisions based on it. And so, but why do we eat meat? Why are we driven by this desire? And, and, and it's, it partly is why there are projections and expectations that as different countries become more financially uh, powerful, that they're going to be eating more meat. Why is that? There's a book out called Meat Hooked, and one of the points that the author makes in it is that meat essentially represents power. Because if you can eat meat, and kind of feeds a little bit on to what Don said here, you can control resources. You can control and own animals. You can control other people. And a lot of times, 
countries who have not had very much and people who have not had very much feel that when they eat meat that they have arrived and so we need to look at this i think emotionally as well and you know i one of the things that's been said over and over is that power corrupts and i think in our meat industry it has been a real corrupting industry and it's corrupted government it's corrupted individuals it's really kind of about power and control over others and i also want to touch on a little bit what tony said about the ghosts and the things which i think is a very interesting point because we have a loss of biodiversity and we also have more lives but a lot of these domesticated farm animals have very limited genetics it's sort of like monocrop plant crops, we have monocrop or limited genetic diversity in our animals that are mass produced on these factory farms. So one of the things that we need that for health and well-being on our planet is diversity. And we can learn from different ideas, um, different genetics, you know, coming together, create more um, health globally, and we're losing that too. Um, and that's also a reflection of power and control. You have certain companies that will patent seeds or patent certain animal genes, and then they own them, so they kind of have an interest then in producing more and selling in our country and beyond. So a large part of this has to come down to power and the emotions around that and giving that up and ultimately making rational choices that serve the broader interest as opposed to more selfish uh, perspective that I want to get mine. And so this is the kind of emotion <laughs> that's at the heart of this whole thing. People are afraid they're not going to get what they need. And so sometimes the meat is a reflection of their, that they have power. And so there's that whole subtle thing that's, that's part of this whole issue, I think. I'm not sure what else to add. Um, I may be a bit of a, a Debbie Downer here <laughs> as a realist. I, I think only 7 to 10 percent of the American population is vegetarian, I, I believe, today, which means 9 out of 10 Americans eat animal products, and this is the United States. Um, we need to be realistic. We can't just say, don't eat meat. <clears throat> That's not going to do it. Uh, it's like Nancy Reagan saying, just say no to drugs. That didn't work. Um, I lived in the third world. I've lived in Africa. I've lived in Latin America. I lived in places where people do subsist on rice and beans. And yes, they would like to have some chicken once in a while. And I have a difficult time as a first world person in a wealthy country wagging my finger at them. I have a difficult time wagging my finger at Americans who choose to feed their families meat. That doesn't mean the meat is good, but we're not going to stop this tomorrow. It's just unrealistic. And I understand that grass-fed uh, animal production has its problems, but we need to think in terms of steps. We need to think in terms of bridges. We need to th think in terms, unfortunately, of progress that takes place, again, step by step. Um, and and it's, it's difficult for me to tell people, meat is evil, so don't eat it. I don't think that's the right message to tell people. <clears throat> and I don't have the answer. Um, now, that said, and, and again, this is not going to be a popular thing to say, but um, plant-based agriculture has its own problems. We have things like Roundup, which is used on food crops. Uh, that product is now getting into the water supply. It's a known endocrine disruptor. It hurts wildlife. Uh, it can cause... Uh, uh, neurological developmental disorders. Um, we need to think about our entire food supply. This is not just a matter of raising meat. And uh, other things like palm oil in Indonesia. I write a lot about wildlife. I write a lot about endangered species. And we're destroying the jungles of Indonesia and the orangutans are now becoming extinct in our drive for palm oil. So again, it's not just the fact that meat is bad. It's the fact that all of our food production systems are not sustainable. And again, I'm, I'm not going to say that, that I have the answers. Um, my last book was about killer whales. It was about SeaWorld, but I also wrote about killer whales in the ocean. 
and the southern resident killer whale population in Washington State is critically endangered. We may lose them in the next 20 years. One of the reasons are all the dams on the rivers, for example, the four dams on the Snake River, which are used not only for hydroelectric power, but to irrigate crops that feed people. So we're growing plants in Washington State, in Idaho, in Oregon, but we're killing orcas in order to do it. So I know it's very depressing. I'm just saying that there are no easy pat solutions and we're not going to get there overnight. We need to think about all forms of, of food production. But I will say there's also a direct impact on wildlife from animal agriculture. And the one that comes to mind, I, I write for a website, takepart.com. I do a lot of <coughs> uh, writing about uh, endangered species and wildlife. And the state of Washington just authorized the elimination of an entire wolf pack, 17 members of a highly endangered uh, species of gray wolves in Washington state because two cattle ranchers were having their cattle attacked by these wolves. And these ranchers are renting public land for very, very low prices to graze their animals in national forest. And that national forest belongs to us. And those species, and particularly those endangered species in that national forest, belong to us. So to kill wild animals in order to protect not just domestic livestock, but the profits of the people raising that domestic livestock, I absolutely agree, is, is wrong. I think if people were more cognizant of the true cost to the environment and to other animals, and as I mentioned when I first started speaking, to, to humans who live near animal agriculture, things might change, but it's going to be very, very incremental. Um, I don't think, well, it's depressing to talk about because we are running out of time, and, and global warming is real, and methane emissions are real, and, and they are competing with carbon dioxide in terms of hurting our planet and our environment. Um, but I just think we need to be realistic and, and take a very cold-eyed approach to this because just saying something is bad is not going to change public opinion, whether it's in this country or in developing countries. So uh, let's, let's do another round. This, the, let, let's do another round. The specific question is if we continue eating animal products as we are, what are the effects? You each answer that. I asked you to each pick one specific thing. If you would continue with another specific effect of, climb, of eating animal products, um, if you want to mention one we've already mentioned, if you want to add to it, that's okay. Otherwise, um, add another one so we can clearly demonstrate to everyone what the different effects are. So one more round of different things if possible. Sure, great question. All right, so I think you know it's interesting. You're starting to see that we, the, the the panel of experts here, all have a slightly different approach, and that's that's what this is about. I think my concern is that uh, whenever there's a slight omission that is critical to the discussion, for instance, the discussion about the number of animals slaughtered at 70 billion, and Don began the uh, the uh, subtle correction, which is, you know, this is part of the problem is, is that we start thinking of land-based animal agriculture as uh, um, uh, doing an injustice to uh, animals, but basically that's just land-based animal agriculture, and those are the land-based animals. And in fact, the United Nations, if you discuss this with uh, members of the FAO behind the scenes, they'll state very clearly that those uh, other animals in land, with land-based animals that are not, that are somewhat off the grid are roughly around 1.7 trillion chickens are slaughtered each year. And secondly, the amount of fish that are slaughtered each year are between one and three trillion. And I don't think you can separate those out in any way, uh, both from a timeline standpoint, a tipping, a tipping point standpoint, or from uh, a animal welfare, animal uh, ascension being uh, standpoint in terms of what we're doing with those. And you can see already that whenever uh, there's various discussions on this, there's already some type of separation and there really shouldn't be. Um, unless it's unless you want to carry the conversation specifically in one direction or the other. So that being said, that the other thing I'd like to say in response to uh, what Steve said is no, knowing what I just said is that um, if we continue in the same direction that we are, 
again, I'm going to try to hammer this tipping point home, is that in all, climate change, you'll see uh, continued um, irreversibility of the five planetary boundaries that have already been passed. You'll see they're all, all nine are interconnected. So when one uh, collapses, uh, the others will soon follow. And so the, the issue is, is that it's going to be on an, an accelerated uh, curve. And so, or an accelerated fashion. So for instance, the World Economic Forum this year, uh, a highly reputable body of scientists and leaders uh, stated that their number one concern for industry and society was fr uh, freshwater crisis, lack of availability. It wasn't climate change, that was number two. And so one point that we need to make is even though climate change is imminent and the, it's, uh, it has the uh, largest platform of notoriety and it is an exacerbator of all these other areas of global depletion, it doesn't cause these other areas of global depletion. It won't cause uh, freshwater scarcity of 40% by the year 2030. It won't cause the uh, collapse of all commercially viable uh, recognized uh, fish in our oceans predicted. And that's not extinction, that's collapse of their systems by the year 2048, irrespective of climate change. Um, it's not causing the loss of the half, 50% loss of coral reef systems in the Great Barrier Reef or the Caribbean or most of the other uh, reef, reef areas in the world. It's, uh, it's from overfishing. And so we need to um, know that these tipping points are very real uh, and we're going uh, to continue um, to, to, uh, to include other, run past other tipping points. I mentioned freshwater scarcity. I mentioned that um, uh, also um, uh, echoing what Tony said is that uh, where the tipping points in terms of uh, biosphere integrity and extinction, especially biodiversity loss, is happening while we're talking here. While we're speaking, we're losing biodiversity at uh, an accelerated rate. It's already uh, the uh, ocean acidification and warming and loss of biodiversity is already uh, in many ways irreversible uh, in our lifetime. And, um, so, and so one other thing about, um, to help answer that question is, is that uh, the, if we don't recognize these tipping points and we don't allow, um, if we don't foster education and we don't uh, give individuals enough respect to place the bar where it needs to be, and I tell physicians this all the time, and Jim Hicks would appreciate that, that we need to raise the bar to where it should be and then find ways to reach it, especially when you're talking about uh, time that's elapsing. I don't think it's, it's nearly impossible to reach uh, the point where we need to be with these tipping points if we don't at least let people know what they are. There are ways to do that by education. Uh, I changed, and I'm nothing special, and we've changed a number of policymakers already. So I think it's extremely important to uh, at least create the knowledge base that we have exceeded tipping points, we are exceeding the other ones as we move along, and so uh, we cannot any longer uh, 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 allow uh, the lack of knowledge or the suppression of, of this knowledge uh, to take place. And, and, and sure, individuals can make their own decisions. I mean, eventually they'll end up being policies uh, created to uh, create an eco and health risk tax because it's imposing what we are doing by, um, and sure, there are other plant-based systems that may uh, use resources more so than others, but across the board, uh, uh, any animal agricultural system is less sustainable and is than plant-based systems. And it's essentially, if you want to look at it this way, it's, it's not only borrowing, it's stealing resources that we can't provide, we can't support, or we can't um, manage correctly for, it's borrowing them from future generations and it's borrowing them from other species that we share this planet where they're already in overshoot mode. It requires five full planets to s supply or sustain what we currently are taking from it in, from the United States in terms of uh, to support our lifestyle. And uh, the largest single connective thread that weaves its way through every single aspect of global depletion is that of animal agriculture. And so the, 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 the the quickest way we can possibly turn this around, knowing the timelines that we're on, is to, is to educate everyone to this fact and then provide them a path which is to 
eating whole plant-based foods organically grown. So that's, that's what we need to do. Whether, it's, uh, whether everybody's going to reach that goal or not remains to be seen, but we have to at least place it out there for them. So uh, that's where I think we're going to be going if we continue on eating or consuming animals, raising, slaughtering, and, yeah, and eating them. Thank you. I want to talk about the, uh, the waste problem, the excrement that is produced by all these animals. You know, they, they don't deliver the calories that they eat, and they got to go out somewhere, go out in the air, and they go out in their, from their rear end. But um, the numbers that I had put in my book at one time was that in just the United States, the uh, livestock produce 100 and 13,000 pounds of excrement per second, 24-7, year-round. And that, that adds up to 100 and, 130, 130 billion tons per year. So I did the math and figured out that if you are an eater of meat and dairy, that your share of that pile of manure is 12,000 pounds. So if, if that arrived at your driveway on Christmas Eve, it'd take 12 pickup trucks to carry it to your house. If you've got a family of four, do the math, you've got 48 pickup trucks. So that's a visual that, you know, who can, who can visualize hundreds of billions of tons of something but when you, when you think about it, we, we, it's like we ordered it. Amazon delivers it. We ordered all of that crap to be produced, but we're not taking delivery on it. If we had to take delivery on it, it would probably, we'd probably figure out a way to solve that problem. So where is it delivered? It delivered to various places, but eventually it, a lot of it winds up in our, in our watershed, in our water supply, or drains into our oceans. And as that number increases, and we talked about just the United States, and as Richard said, um, there's a lot of animals that, that are being killed, and you mentioned chickens, that however many uh, billions there are that are being killed that we don't even know about. So uh, to me, the, that's the visual that is just absolutely absurd to think that a species like us that's supposed to be intelligent can think that that, that can continue. And I went over in my, in my presentations, I generally have a vision for how we can, how it could possibly be solved, but I'm not gonna get into that right now. I just wanted to dwell on the, the visual of that big pile of manure that simply cannot go on much longer. Stinks, actually. <laughs> okay, I'll just uh, use a bit of time to clarify a couple of points on the numbers, and I don't, I don't want to um, um, spend too much time with this. But w I, I take the point that when I mentioned the 70 billion plus today, tw towards the trajectory of 120 billion, um, that was talking about terrestrial agriculture, so that was misspoken by me, and in the paper I make it very clear um, that it's, that's the limit, is that that's terrestrial agriculture, and it's not even, you know, the fish, numbers of fishes are vastly higher. The 120 billion, though, is including poultry, so the tri it's not the tri that's tri trillions are not um, what the poultry birds right now. The, the poultry birds do make up the biggest, by far, the overwhelming amount of that 70 billion today animal killed poultry birds are the biggest um, biggest number of animal lives uh, but fish we're talking many many many, many billions more perhaps upwards of the tr trillions it's it's but it's blurrier there because there's one of the things, and then maybe I'll just use my time to say a bit about the fisheries one of the things that's really a momentous shift in the world's oceans is that um, open ocean fisheries have all peaked so basically Every ocean around the world has peaked. It's, it's already past, it's post-peak. And that comes from the United Nations Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, which was the biggest survey of world ecosystems ever conducted. And basically every open ocean fishery has peaked and now it's post-peak, meaning they're pulling out less now 
in biomass than they did when it was at its peak. But it's not only that the biomass is peaked, it's that they're fishing lower on the trophic web and in many ocean uh, ecosystems that the, the biomass at the top of the trophic web, so the top piscivores, the top fish at the food chain, are, many of them are a fraction, like one or two or three percent of what they were, uh, you know, half century ago. So there's this shrinking um, Bi biomass of fish at the top of the trophic webs and ocean fisheries, the deep trawlers are pulling out to try and just keep close to, like they haven't collapsed yet, but they're, they're sort of plateaued or slightly declining, to keep that biomass up harvesting from the ocean. This is part of the reason why the numbers are going up. They're harvesting lower on the food chain. And if you're interested in this, there's an incredible resource called the Sea Around Us Project that brings together all kinds of ocean yeah, ecosystem scientists, and the, again, the, over, the, the evidence is overwhelming that um, the way the biomass is sort of relatively kept from completely collapsing in open ocean fisheries is by feed, fishing lower and lower uh, in the trophic web. Another dimension of the fisheries that is, is, is really important to, to recognize is the explosion of industrial aquaculture. So in 1980, there was virtually no fish on a world scale that were consumed from industrial aquaculture. 1980 was a sliver of world fish production. Today it's about half. It's around close to or maybe surpassing half in one of these years. Ha that's a, you know, not very long ago, right? 35 years from nothing to basically half the world's fish harvest is coming now from intensive aquaculture. How do you feed those pit industrial scale uh, fish farms, where do they, so you need to either find fish meal from, harvested from other ecosystems and ground up, or increasingly there's the uh, flows of meal from fish farms to livestock and livestock meal to fish farms. Um, so this, you know, incredibly unsustainable uh, dimension of the world's um, uh, fish production, which we haven't really talked about. But I think I just wanted to maybe clarify some of the fish discussion because they're absolutely right when, you know, those numbers, um, the fish numbers dwarf the numbers I was giving. Uh, and, and, and there's all kinds of scary currents that are uh, unfolding in the world's oceans. That's even before we start talking about acidification and, and, and various, the plastic uh, in the world's oceans, the mass of plastic on a scale that is close to bi the biomass in the ocean. Now some scientists are suggesting, but that's even before we get to that. <laughs> and I was just tipping my hat to the aquatic animals. That's actually not my specialty. I actually um, am a land animal. Uh, focused uh, person and uh, I do a lot with numbers I read a lot of statistics and uh, I have to tell you Morris even hearing your waste statistics the wow emoji just kept coming up like wow 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 <laughs> so you really made it real um, beyond just the numbers uh, that's that's pretty scary so, um, well, as I was mentioning before, I've, I've been vegan since grad school, almost 20 years, and uh, I'm used to being called not pragmatic, uh, sentimental, and uh, it's, it's really interesting because vegans, we are the pragmatists. It is people who are clutching uh, their meat and their dairy and their eggs for all their life, um, clinging to them. They are the ones who are, are sentimental. We have the numbers, the statistics, the economics. We can tell you about the health benefits, the environmental benefits. Uh, we've got research after research. We've got the moral high ground on top of it. Uh, yet still, we're the, the, the sentimental ones. And again, most of my talks are about economics uh, and numbers and, and the benefits and, and, like I said, getting it on the agenda. And I, I'm, not, I'm not coming um, after you, David. Um, but I do want to clarify, um, you know, when you're talking about plant-based agriculture and the use of Roundup, use of pesticides, GMOs, that more than a third of the world's crops are used for animal feed. So if you're concerned about Roundup, if you're concerned about GMO, what you want to do is reduce crops. And if we weren't cycling so inefficiently these crops through livestock to create meat, to create dairy, to create animal products, then we would be using a lot less. So anytime someone brings up, I, I had um, uh, someone bring to my attention this article about um, more animals being killed um, fielding 
crops uh, eating plant-based than if you were to eat the animals directly. But that's not taking into consideration the fact that all those monocultures, those soy and crop monocultures, those are being fed to animals overwhelmingly. And I've also had people, you know, kind of come at me as a vegan from all my soy consumption and the soy being deforesting the rainforest. And it's like, that soy is not for me. <laughs> That's for your meat. So don't, don't come after me as, as the vegan. Um, you're, you're not going to win that one. But um, so just so, yeah, please. It's not, with respect to genetic modification, it's not just that crops in general command about a third of the world's arable land. G genetic modified crops, there's only a handful, and they represent a very large scale of, um, of arable land in the United States and in some other places like Canada, where I'm from, and in, in southern cone of South America. Um, genetically modified crops are overwhelmingly fed to animals. So the big, the big ones in GM are soy and corn, and those are principally going direct. And then there's also cotton, which obviously isn't a food crop, but uh, soy and corn are, are predominantly feed crops. So GM is really disproportionately uh, an animal feed crop. Yeah, and it's concentrating in the animals' bodies, just like the pesticides. So if you're, you're washing your fruit and you're concerned about all the pesticides on your fruit, but then you go and eat a burger, all those pesticides have been concentrating in the, the cow's flesh and you're eating concentrated pesticides. So um, the, the same goes with the GMOs. So if those are concerns of yours, which they should be, uh, again, it's another reason that plant-based foods are, are the better option. Uh, one of the points I would have liked to have made earlier, which I didn't though, is that it doesn't compete with other things that we do. So we do like to kind of debate, well, you know, how much is transportation versus livestock and you know, which is more and is it this industry or that industry? industry, but the thing is, is it doesn't compete. And as an individual, what can we do? And you can still take your short showers and you can still take public transportation and it doesn't mean you have to eat a hamburger, right? So it's part of a toolbox. You can feel empowered. You've got something in your toolbox to use in addition. So you don't have to choose between short showers and, and garden burgers. You can, you can do both. Uh, <laughs> I can tell you which one's going to make the bigger difference. Uh, with regards to palm oil, there's nothing about vegan that, you know, vegans I think are some of the strongest advocates against palm oil um, because we care about the animal issues um, so strongly. So as, as a vegan, yes, you know, no palm oil, cut, cut it out, it's, it's horrible. Um, and if you also, I want to make a point too, if you care about animals, sometimes doing this math is tricky. So. Within the, the animal protection, animal rights community, there's, there's some who say, you know what, if you're just going to tell people one thing, tell them, you know, to, to no, don't eat chickens. Because what happens a lot of times when people stop eating meat or they eat less meat, they eat less cow. And when you eat less cow, if you eat more pigs and chickens, actually more animals are dying, especially chickens, right? So if you reduce your cow consumption, your chicken consumption skyrockets, and the number of animals dying skyrocket. So that's a, that's a pretty valid point if your primary concern is animals. But if cows, and they do, cause more greenhouse gases when they're grass-fed, and a lot of cows are a mix of grass-fed and grain-fed, if they're causing more climate change, which they are, unless they're purely grain fed, and then it's about equal, but I'll go in that tomorrow at 11, um, then they are causing more climate change. It's more greenhouse gases. And when you have greenhouse gases, you're destroying ecosystems. So then you're destroying all kinds of animals that we might not even know about. You're killing more wild animals. And again, animals I don't even know because they're too small to count. But if you care about animal life, uh, you really can't say that eating meat versus chicken causes fewer animal deaths or more animal deaths. It's a, really, it's a really tricky math. So again, if you care about plants, I know somebody out there is saying plants have feelings too. If you care about plant feelings, stop eating meat because you'll eat less plants. Um, all right. Da, da, da. Oh, demand. So uh, again, on the pragmatism thing. So. Uh, Demand is a social construct. So yes, as economies uh, become more well-off financially, 
They do eat more meat, uh, but meat in the U.S. and meat uh, globally, it's, it's subsidized, it's valued. So if we can move from meat being celebrated as meat being shunned, it should be considered more of a junk food. Start reframing it so that it's like cigarette smoking. It's still going to happen. We're not naive. It's still going to happen. But start shifting it away from being associated with power and reassociating it with disease and natural resource destruction and climate catastrophes. That's how we start reframing it. Stop subsidizing it. So these are really pragmatic things that we can do, and, and it will start happening if push comes to shove. Um, I also uh, wanted to comment about uh, Robert Goodland. I'm from D.C. Um, uh, he might not have started off vegan, but after doing his research, uh, he was vegan um, for, for the end of his life, and um, I was very fortunate to be able to, to work with him on some stuff towards the end, and um, it's a very sad loss. Um, and then this is this is a good one. All right, so Richard, Richard, I, I n really never come in stronger than you. You're usually saying things as strong as as more strong than I would be willing to say it. And so I'm glad you're there, being the voice for saying it as strong as possible. But I am right now going to say it stronger. So he, uh, Richard, made the point of borrowing from future generations. I would take that out, and we're stealing, stealing from future generations, and not even stealing, but we are killing. We are killing future generations because if we don't stop climate change. It, it, we've got these catastrophes. These are going to keep happening. And even if the catastrophes don't hit you personally, just the changes in the food insecurity that's going to happen as, as the grains start shifting and we're not able to keep up with the food supply, and then the economic unrest that it's going to cause, this is massive. So we are, we're not just borrowing from future generations. We're stealing from them at best, and we're killing them at worst, and at very likely worst. So again, we don't have to choose. Please minimize, uh, to be pragmatic, minimize. Minimize your meat consumption, avoid animal products. And when I say meat, I mean all animal products. So that's just a shorthand so that I don't have to say meat, dairy, eggs all the time. So all animal products, minimize your meat consumption. The more you do, the better. So I'm making it accessible. The more you do, the better. It's a tool. Thank you very much. Completely agree with that. You know. The aspiration is to create the vegan world, but pragmatically steps in that direction, so minimizing. But the quicker we can take those steps, and the faster we can take them, also the better. Um, on the aquaculture issue, which has been coming up, and it is true that far more fish are killed than land animals, um, and just to speak to the attitude again of power that comes with animal exploitation and with this whole industry, some years ago, I was reading in Feedstuffs, which is like the Wall Street Journal of agribusiness, um, about aquaculture. And they were concerned about how wild fish stocks were being depleted. And you know, rather than saying, this is a problem, we need to act more responsibly, we need to stop destroying wild fish populations by overfishing them, they said, well, this creates an opportunity for aquaculture. Because now they're going to able to be able to control the supply and control the whole chain. Um, and so this is, again, the attitude of disrespect and power over nature, over animals, over people in some cases. Another area in terms of numbers that hasn't come up here yet is the animals that die before even getting to the slaughterhouse. You know, in the chicken industry in the U.S., we raise about nine, almost nine billion chickens. Hundreds of millions die before even getting to the slaughterhouse every year. In some cases, they are rendered and turned into animal feed. In other cases, they're actually just put into landfills or discarded. And so this creates more pollution, more toxins, more potential pathogens into the environment. Another thing that hasn't come up is the antibiotics. The vast majority of the antibiotics used in the U.S. are fed to animals to keep them alive and growing in these filthy factory farming conditions. That also gets into the environment. It creates uh, antibiotic resistant pathogens that have actually been found in groundwater downstream from factory farms. And then here's the kicker. You know, this pharmaceutical industry doesn't only make a lot of money on these animals who are being exploited, it then makes a lot of money on humans whose arteries are clogged by animal fat. And then there are habits that develop in our medical professions that are also unhealthy and cause harm. I, I um, have been a vegan since 1985, as I mentioned, have never had any heart issues, and, but I was getting into my 40s, I'm in my 50s now, 
and I hadn't been to a doctor in decades. And I thought, you know, I should go to a doctor just to make sure everything's okay. So I go to this doctor and he asks me about heart disease in my family. And my father had had a heart attack and my grandfather had died of a heart attack. So I told that to this doctor. And he said to me, without taking my blood or any, doing any tests, he said he might want to put me on heart medication. So this is just an example of how certain habits become the norm. And bad has become normal in terms of how we relate to other animals and how we mistreat them and how we have absolutely no regard for them. And in some cases, I think doctors, I mean, most doctors care and do good stuff, but sometimes become creatures of habit too and are quick to just prescribe a medication without necessarily really looking into the issue and making a thoughtful, respectful diagnosis and decision about it. Um, so anyway, there's the, it's clear that animal agriculture is a huge problem. And I think the question is, how do we solve it? And I agree, it's not simple. I mean, there's monocrop agriculture, but most of that monocrop plant agriculture does go to animal agriculture. So eating plants directly is far more efficient in so many ways. And there are now urban farms, and there are, there's a, a food not lawns movement. There's rooftop gardens that also have other benefits. In addition to creating more green space in the city, which helps with climate issues. Um, I was talking to somebody the other day about a building that just put a green rooftop on it. And one of the additional benefits is that their air conditioning system that brings in air from the roof now is bringing in much cooler air than when it was just a cement rooftop because it was so hot. So you have little things like this that are beneficial when you live in a way that's more mindful and more compassionate and more healthful. Uh, thank you. What I wanted to discuss, it, it's probably very specific to the United States, but I think it applies to other countries as well. How many people here, including on the panel, although I imagine the panel does know, uh, know exactly what the United States Farm Bill is and does. Nobody. Uh, <laughs> you exactly is, exactly is a big word. <laughs> I'm sorry? Farm Bill, the one that extended past No, just past the Farm Bill in general. It gets passed it's, every It's about 500 five, billion. Yeah, not how much it is, but what it does and what yeah. it means. Yeah. Uh, my, my point being, and you brought up subsidies, and that's where I'm going with this, we subsidize the meat industry with our taxpayer dollars, whether it's subsidizing corn and soybean production or directly subsidizing beef, chicken, dairy production. <clears throat> I wrote about dairy farms that were getting tens of thousands of dollars a year from the federal government in our money. And I think if we were to look at the influence on public policy, when I talk about the farm bill, when I talk about subsidies, I, I, I can see people going to sleep <laughs> because it's not something we pay attention to. This goes on under the radar, particularly if you don't live in a farm state. And we have our subsidy priorities completely turned upside down. And that's why, for example, my nephew, who is in college, when he goes to the supermarket, he sees pork butt for 99 cents a pound and he sees broccoli for 2.99 a pound. What is he gonna buy? he's gonna buy the pork butt because he doesn't have a lot of money to spend on food. If we switch that around, and again, this is something that citizen activism can do. This is what politics is all about. This is if we really wanna put our money where our mouth is, we should pay attention to what's going on in Washington. We should pay attention to the corporate power that I mentioned at the beginning because it's corrupting our system and it's providing billions of dollars in our money to subsidize this system that I think we all agree is, is, is uh, wrong and harmful, and yet nobody does anything about the Farm Bill because A, they don't know about it, no fault of your own. This is not mentioned in the media. I'm a journalist and I'm often ashamed of my profession because we're too often worried about, you know, who peed on a wall in Brazil. Um, <laughs> when, when, when Ben Washington can quietly go and pass this legislation every few years that has an enormous impact. Um, I mentioned last night when I spoke, 2015 had the highest increase in meat consumption in this country in 40 years. And that was almost all due to chicken because there was such overproduction of chicken last year. It wasn't an increase in pork or beef, 
there was a huge increase in chicken production because it was so much cheaper to produce and it was so much cheaper to sell and people went to the store and bought it. And our meat is too cheap and our fruits and vegetables are too expensive. And that's because of subsidies. And if we're concerned about this, we need to get political. We need to support candidates who are gonna take on the power structure in Washington. We need to take on lobbyists who, who spend billions or millions of dollars a year trying to get these farm bill subsidies passed. Um, it's, in a way, all of our faults because we're too complacent. We don't pay attention to what's going on in Washington. We're very involved with our own lives. I agree with everything that's been said on this panel tonight, but I think this is one area that gets overlooked because people feel like there's nothing they can do. Well, we, we, we try to influence public policy in many, many ways. We try to elect candidates that support our positions. Uh, we try to support uh, NGOs that are in Washington working for policies that we support. This is one policy that actually could be changed. Now, we're up against a very, very powerful corporate culture in this country that wants that farm bill passed every few years, that wants those subsidies for corn and soybean and animal production. But what if we subsidized apple farmers? What if we subsidized tomato farmers? What if we subsidized any fruit or vegetable producer so that they could produce that product much more cheaply, get it to the market more cheaply, and it would compete with meat. It would compete with eggs and dairy and milk. So it just seems to me that that is one concrete thing that could be done that absolutely is not being done. That um, very good um, point of emphasis on the subsidy bill or the uh, uh, subsidies laden in the farm bill. If you're interested in this, there's a group called the Environment Working Group, ewg.org, and they have an incredible database. It's an amazing public resource which shows who's getting what. And one of the big things they stress year over year is that subsidies go to the biggest of the big. 75% or so of the subsidies go to the, you know, less than 10% of the biggest farmers. And they make it very clear. You can scan over, you go into the states, it shows who's getting what. Uh, it's just a really great resource to see the huge inequalities that are embedded in the farm bill. That's the environment, environmental working group. Good point. Give us a quick second. Can I sum things up here a little bit? I think, I think that uh, we probably answered bits and pieces of Steve's next 10 questions with all that. Uh, I'd like to do one quick uh, circling back to his question, which is about projecting where we all think, where the panelists would think we'll be with the, as we're eating animals currently with our current agricultural systems. And I think we, you know, a lot of us touched on future changes and in terms of transitioning to aquaculture and even we could be talking about aquaponics, which is the next uh, stage. We could talk about urban agriculture that's gonna be uh, affecting 70% of the 70% uh, of the projected rise in, in uh, human uh, population by the year 2050, the 9.6 billion will be uh, in urban uh, settings. Uh, but um, but in actuality, to to bring this back around, I think I can summarize pretty well uh, where I, I think we're going to be, and where anybody looking at these models will where I think we will be if we continue on the same path. You know, I talked about timelines uh, a while back, but you know. This year, I was, uh, I was uh, asked to speak to Hawaii's Senate and to the state of Hawaii on behalf of their environment because they knew they had some issues and the policymakers uh, didn't feel capable of addressing them correctly because they would lose their constituents, the ones that were aware. But in a nutshell, Hawaii imports, I mean, how many here have been to Hawaii? Yeah, panels? Yeah, great. It's a, it's a beautiful state, isn't it? It really is. So from an environmental standpoint, it's a mess. Hawaii imports 90, over 90% 90 of their food uh, each year at a tune of $3 billion per year. Uh, they don't have, they can't produce enough food for, to supply for their 1 million people. That's because 83% of their land isn't, of their ag land used for agriculture isn't used for growing food. It's for growing cattle. For, and it's grazing, it's not industrial. At a tune of about, they're producing about 40 pounds of what they call meat or food 
uh, per acre. Uh, we can go into a lot of detail at some other time, but other portions of their uh, agricultural land are used for actually seeds, for producing seeds, uh, for what uh, some of the other panelists were talking about, GMO seeds, that are then shipped back to the mainland. But essentially, essentially, 83% of all their land used for agriculture uh, is, for, uh, is for cattle, uh, either grazing or for seed, uh, the seed company. They have, Hawaii has the largest amount at one time of indigenous fish, mean, meaning fish are no, not found anywhere else in the world other than Hawaii. Their, their indigenous fish have been lost up to 75% up to of those indigenous fish are lost now with some areas near their four main islands at about 90% loss. The, the, the loss of the fish and their, uh, their damaged reef systems uh, are no surprise. It's because of uh, commercial and recreational fishing. So for me to, to then answer uh, Steve's question, if, if we continue on the same path we're on, I think Hawaii is a perfect example of, of where we are uh, as a global community. The, the difference is, is that Hawaii has the luxury of importing food to their, to their people, whereas we as a global society don't have that luxury. Uh, they're quickly running out of land and uh, fish. So I think that's exactly where we're gonna be going. Uh, and if you project this out in any way whatsoever, that's, it's just that we happen to be on slightly different timelines than Hawaii. So, uh, and lastly, about the, the subsidies that David mentioned, uh, you know, we really live in a global community, so I think that we need to, uh, it's nice to know what the United States is doing, of course, uh, but uh, what we, our decisions that we make and the uh, largest industries that are powering the the agricultural systems today uh, are really being driven through a number of different uh, populations, such as China, Japan, uh, the Middle East, and uh, there's this triangulation that's occurring between the large industries and these developing countries that have the most land to to uh, to to give or to be stolen from. Uh, so it's the subsidies globally are at 500 billion dollars. So there's 500 billion dollars per year that are supporting the meat, dairy, and fishing industries. So we can't really, we don't want to really be separating out any of those. And lastly, that um, if so, if we continue in the same mode, we're just propping up those industries that are essentially killing us. Less than 2% of all crops grown globally today are with organic methods for direct human consumption. So I hope that helps. So, um the warmest month on record since 1880 was July of this year. Set the record as the warmest month in history. Until August, which tied it. So the two warmest months since 1880 in the history of taking records was July and August of this year. Um, you can make the argument that things have changed. Um, in 1942, President Roosevelt said to all the car companies, no more cars are gonna be made. He said you can't make any more cars all resources have to be funneled towards helping us in the war and making heavy-duty machinery and weapons. They banned the sale of private automobiles in the United States. They took every single resource and focused it on the production of equipment to fight in the war. This was in the beginning of Lester Brown's uh, book. So assume that the country's not really getting all the things you're saying, we're not aware of the potential, and we keep having these radical disturbances in our climate, at some point, assume someone's gonna say, hey, wait a minute, this is not a problem for 50 years from now, this has to be dealt with immediately. And assume they said to each of you, you're in charge of fixing the problem. So in terms of fixing the environmental issues and the other issues related to this, um, if you were fully in charge and everyone was eager to listen and learn, and we were interested in promoting your five best solutions on social media and at work and everywhere. If people would listen to you, what are the five things that you would like to implement that, we could, that everyone could follow? What, what are your very best five suggestions um, to solve all of these problems as rapidly and urgently as we can, assuming that the situation has progressed and it's no longer a 2050 issue, it's a 2016 issue?
Sure. Great question, by the way. Uh, let me, I can sum my thoughts up pretty quickly on this. I think the five, the five uh, most important uh, actions that we could take today or that I would support would be, one of course is to, uh, and this is not in, in order of uh, importance, one is to decrease our use of fossil fuels, which is no, no news. The second is to decrease waste, which is no news. The third is to uh, increase uh, our, to help assist policymakers uh, with, uh, with decision making by influencing them as much as possible on those things that will create the greatest change. And uh, the fourth would be uh, to increase education. And the fifth, would be a combination of all those to uh, do whatever we can, as I said, in a combination of all those things to uh, not, not reduce, but to get our, our agricultural systems to the point uh, as quickly as possible to uh, create regeneration uh, of, of, uh, of the largest amount of sequestration that we can possibly do and the least amount of greenhouse gases that we can uh, emit. And in doing that, the, the equation would be to eat only plant-based foods. And uh, that's the quickest route uh, because we are not going to be able to, uh, it's nearly impossible to reduce fossil fuels uh, and waste uh, in the amount of time that, uh, where we can create measurable change and yet uh, we can change out what we eat and we can do it today. Lastly, as an example, is that uh, by all, all indications, just moving to alternative fuel, it will take about 34 years and about $1 trillion per year. And uh, again, by all indications, you know, we need to uh, reduce our uh, greenhouse, our anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions, human induced, by half of the 54 gigatons uh, by the year 2020. It used to be 20% by 2020, and now all climate scientists uh, agree that it probably should be half. And we have to get it net a net uh, greenhouse gas uh, uh, emissions by, uh, to get it to net zero by the year 2050. And the easiest way to do that is by moving through plant-based systems. Uh, that's the quickest and easiest way to do it. I, I understand there's you know, uh, a pragmatism issue here, but uh, that is the quickest way to do it. Um, I'm not sure about the list of five, but I'll, I'll give you my thoughts on that. Uh, first of all, I've been studying the, or did study a little bit about the meat consumption on a global scale, and I found that 72% of the meat, meat, uh, meat, meat, pork, and dairy, uh, beef, pork, and dairy, was eaten in five regions of the world: um, China being number one, Europe number two, U.S. number three, Brazil and Russia four and five, and and I kind of computed that 72% uh, uh, that uh, that 72% of the of that meat was being eaten by the wealthiest two billion people in the world. And don't ask me exactly how I extrapolated that number, but uh, there's a lot of people that don't eat much meat, and there's a lot of people that eat a lot of meat. And so I think we need to go go in the direction of of the people that are eating the most meat. Now. Um, in my presentation yesterday, I, I talked about the, an extrapolation I'd made about meat consumption. And in the United States, it's, it's leveled off and it's going down a little bit in beef. And in Europe, it's, you know, it's, it's leveled off quite a bit. But in China, it's, they've gone from tying us a couple of decades ago. Now they eat twice as much meat as we do in China. And so there's... Um, there's a tendency, I think, to, for us to become complacent of the public that, that things are getting better, you know, that we're eating less meat and there's more vegan restaurants and this and that, and there's more solar panels on the roofs. But I think, I think that's a mistake to become complacent because if you extrapolate the data, I concluded that for every American or European that's trying to move toward a plant-based diet, moving in that direction, there's a up to 100 people in the developing world moving in the other direction. And not only that, they're buying a car for the first time. So I think the numbers we talked about earlier, 9.5 billion people by mid-century and, and, and the, the tonnage of meat that's gonna 
keep going up. I just don't think that's going to happen. I think there's going to be some terrible things happen if we don't learn to manage it. Uh, I refer to two, be two books in my presentations that I consider wake-up calls, and uh, one's by Lester Brown, Full Planet, Empty Plates. The other one is by Dr. Stephen M. Ott, um, 10 Billion. And I consider, particularly M. Ott's book, I call it a book for leaders because I think he does an outstanding job in a one-hour read of describing um, what's probably going to happen if we don't get a handle on things. And I had an opportunity to visit with him in London a few years ago, just after that book came out. And, I, and he, he had concluded that we weren't going to make it till the end of this century as a civilization. And he's got a lot of credentials to support his conclusions. But I asked him, I said, if we could convince the 80% um, the of the people that are eating the most meat to replace 75% of their meat and dairy calories with plants, do you think your projection of us collapsing as a civilization would change? And he said he couldn't compute that. He couldn't answer that without computing it, but it would take him a while. But he did say that there would be an enormous benefit to our overall global ecology environment if that, if that were to take place. So my feeling is, I, I totally agree with Richard, we're, we're running out of time and, and things have to change quickly. And the, based on my background as a business executive and an, an executive recruiter, I think it boils down to leadership. And I have not run across a single powerful leader in the world that's really as concerned about this as probably everybody in this room is. And, and I, I'm pretty passionate about the topic, and I believe that a single powerful leader with as much passion and conviction as I have would take us a long way, way towards solving this problem, and I think it, that's coupled with, with money. So I'm in the process of sorting through um, billionaire candidates, uh, if you will, or people with global rep reputation, positive global reputations, and either have a lot of money or access to a lot of money. And I believe that a person like that, it only takes one, could build a team of other people like that and commence a global awareness campaign, a massive global awareness campaign, never ending. And some people say, well, are you crazy? How much would that cost? And I said, well, I don't know what it would cost, but I, I pick a number, five billion, 10 billion. How much communication to, to everybody in the world that's got a laptop or an iPhone could you, could you get done with five or $10 billion? And if you had credible messengers, you could, you could start changing some habits pretty quickly and you keep going. And so what, what is the number? Well, um, Microsoft, just, I mean, Facebook just bought WhatsApp for $22 billion. You know, WhatsApp, half the people in the room may not even know what WhatsApp is. I didn't a couple of years ago, and I was traveling overseas. But uh, if, a, if a simple app for a smartphone is worth $22 billion, what is, what is a future of our civilization worth? So maybe it's $100 billion that, that this group of wealthy people pull together and really start pulling out the stops. We're, we've never been in a better position to communicate with every, every person in the world that's connected to some electronic device. Things can happen pretty quickly. We could mobilize like we did in World War II, but I don't see it happening without powerful leadership that can go directly to the consumer. You can't go to governments and start messing around with, with uh, trying to strike deals. It's, You've got to go to the demand side of the equa equation and get people demanding plant-based foods. I think it all boils down to getting people to go to plant-based foods, and I'll probably go to my grave thinking that. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, so I started off talking about metification and that, that as that really fundamental context for thinking about these global issues. And at the end of my book, I talk about the case for demetification and argue that the whole book builds towards the argument that this is one of the most fundamental social justice issues today. It's one of the most fundamental is issues that bears on climate change, biodiversity loss, our interaction with other species directly and indirectly. And so I think the demetification imperative is, is something that, um, we, that, that we need to be fighting on, on many fronts to, to pursue and, and building alliances with people who are working on climate justice, people who are work, communicating why this is such an important social justice issue for global equity and global inequalities, people who care about obviously our relationship with other animals and, and, and the loss of biodiversity. So the demetification imperative on one level, uh, I, I know it, the these huge exploding populations of animals could be um, imploded very quickly if we stopped artificially inseminating them. The, the livestock in North America is overwhelmingly reproduced through artificial insemination. The animals can't even reproduce themselves. They've been so modified and the systems have been organized to accelerate their turnover time. But and put on and, and gain weight. Um, so that's part of that basic genetics. So in some ways, that, that, that's a very simple thing. If we stopped inseminating uh, animal, artificially inseminating, violating animals, that would be a very, it could be a very quick uh, implosion of this, what I call this other population bomb that a lot of environmentalists don't talk about. Uh, and related to this, this and Steve's big question of the basic th things that need to change. A basic thing that needs to change is stop funneling huge volumes of grain and oil seed through livestock. And that has obviously huge economic compulsions to that. It, it's been an, an, it's one of the big ways, and a lot of I think environmental people concerned with these issues don't appreciate how important livestock it, livestock has been as a way of absorbing surpluses and enabling them to still be profitable. So livestock as a as a way of uh, profitably absorbing grain and oilseed surpluses. So I think there needs to be a real attention to how, how ways of of stopping cycling of grains and oilseed through livestock. And one of that is, is relates back to the subsidy point that that David was saying. The subsidies are so skewed towards the big industrial producers, and there's a need to fight over those battles. That's a very real political battle, and this whole story is fighting over the redirection of subsidies to small agroecological farmers uh, at every scale in education systems, but also into uh, applied extension in our universities, the university, the land grant is universities where a lot of the ag research is done here is overwhelmingly skewed towards the big um, Ag agricultural corporations that where there's a handful of dominant players in seeds and chemicals and animal pharmaceuticals and increasingly those are all intertwined those those inputs um, on one I just want to my last thing I'll say is just to clarify the point about because uh, we've mentioned China at a few different points and I'll talk a bit about China tomorrow um, China is often presented as this bogey man in this whole picture and it is phenomenal increases and, and it was mentioned that China has doubles the US production but in per capita terms the US doubles China so when we talk about demetification, it, it starts here. It starts in North America and Europe and the richest countries in the world. And in fact, China's ahead, uh, for, for many years, China's, the Chinese government has actually pursued, aggressively pursued metification as a state goal, as a marker of development, a marker of modernity, with some of the stuff that Jean was talking about, power. Uh, are the, real, the government really celebrated and officially supported the metification of Chinese diets to an incredible extent. In 1980, the average Chinese person consumed far below the world average in uh, per capita consumption of meat. Now they're far above the world average. But that double the American production, again, on a per capita basis is still much less than the US. So the average person in China is um, not uh, a bit more than half of what the average American eats. So China is still far below. But on a hope, quite hopeful note, recently, and this drew a fair bit of attention uh, this earlier this year, the Chinese government basically recognized this is a crash course. This is a disaster. China's, how is chi China is home to about a fifth of humanity. It's home to half the world's pigs. How are those pigs being fed? Increasingly, those pigs are being fed from soybeans that are coming from South America. And the Chinese government is, is, has this year, 
made a ba basically recognition an explicit recognition this trajectory is not sustainable and they're ar arguing that there needs to be rather than the continuing meatification of Chinese diets as a pursuit of the, the, the state they're saying actually the Chinese diet needs to cut out its meat uh, or not cut out it entirely but reduce in a, on a sig very significant scale and they set very aggressive targets now whether that materializes or not well, remains to be seen but it's quite notable that the, the state recognized this is a disastrous trajectory for climate, for water. China also has huge water scarcity issues in its north area, the, 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 like the US, under over-reliance on freshwater resources, including an, an, over de being, um, an underground aquifer that's being depleted very drastically. And so the state basically recognized this needs to change and has set some targets. Now, whether that materializes again is, is, is another thing that remains to be seen, but I think there's something hopeful there in the state, really a, a very big U-turn from what it said. Now, I mean, there, now whether the Chinese corporations agree with that, we'll see. Uh, the, a few years ago, the big, one of the big Chinese giants, uh, Shineway, bought out the biggest pig producer in the U.S. Smithfield. Uh, so they have very aggressive global plans um, that might not exactly fall in line with that, that uh, aspiration that the state has said. But I do think that is one potentially hopeful uh, thing that's emerged in recent yeah, I was going to make a similar point, and we'll also be expanding on the, the China issue tomorrow at 11. Uh, it's, it's a really big deal. And then you wouldn't think China is going to be the example, but that's what I was talking about, or in my head I was talking about, because I'll talk about it in my presentation tomorrow, so I might not have actually said it out loud here. But the, the U.S. really needs to take a lead and be a global leader, and that's part of the reason that as individuals, um, our patterns, our priorities make such a big difference, because if we can change U.S priorities, not only are we changing our own consumption patterns, which are massive overconsumption patterns, but we're so powerful globally that we're going to change international patterns. And we want to set the example. So I think I did reference it a little bit. We want to be the example, say, don't, don't follow us, learn from our bad habits. And so that's what China is doing right now. They're saying, don't, oh, this is too much. And um, they're, they're pulling it back. Hopefully, they, at least they intend to. Uh, Steve, you kind of gave a little bit of a magic wand with the way you framed that question, so I'm going to take that as a, a magic wand and make myself very powerful right now. So f first would be food reform. I had uh, somebody ask me a long time ago, they're like, you know, if, if, you would make, if you could make meat illegal, you would. And it, it, like it was a bad thing, I was like, oh, yes, I would. <laughs> Yes, I would, absolutely. So um, animal agriculture, be gone. It's gone. Magic wand. Um, I, I'm also, but I'm going to take the food form a little bit further. So we're going to also just, in general, break up monopolies and decorporatize um, the food system. So food is going to be a basic right. It's not going to be profit-driven. And we're going to do food for health. So you know what else I'm going to get rid of? Junk food. That's right. Bye-bye. Tiramisu, bye-bye. I don't care if it's vegan. Nope. Food for health, food for health. I don't eat that way. I just want to tell you, I went for quite some time on a vegan pizza and pudding binge. And as an adult, I was like, well, I can eat pudding first. I don't have to eat it. And I would, then I was like, oh, I could have it second too. So I really would sandwich, you know, pudding, pizza pudding. But it was vegan. But if I ruled the world, none of that would happen. Okay, so that was one, food reform. Second, population, and this is really important when we're talking uh, about global sustainability and balancing population and consumption concerns. So I am not saying this in a way that is, um, is, is, is broad stroke. So this is actually practical. So um, to, to help with the population concerns is we have to increase uh, women's empowerment. We have to uh, get schools, um, uh, girls educated, uh, decrease uh, the gender biases and discrimination, um, eliminate, get rid of gender discrimination, get rid of racial discrimination. So when you're talking about the population growth, that is primarily happening in the lower and middle income countries and that's happening a lot in Africa and a lot in Asia and India is where you're seeing those um, those birth growth rates 
But, and that's what, how, how it's framed. And oh, people over there having all those babies causing all those problems. You can never talk about population and be fair and be effective without talking about the consumption levels in the US in the high income countries because it's not the people having the babies that are causing the consumption issues. It's the high income consumers. But population, it is a concern. And especially when you, do, you have a country like China with 1.4 billion people almost are about to reach there. They're, what they're doing matters a lot. And so I'm, I'm really glad that you brought out the point about, yes, they eat twice as much meat as the US, but they're four times as large. So per person, uh, they're only eating half as much meat as, as we are. And already they get it and are reeling it back. So population versus consumption, it's, we got to really be balanced and, and be careful of the blame game on, on that. So that, that's actually practical, um, but working on, on managing population. I would cap economic disparities and put a strong safety net. So again, also one of the reasons population growth is such an issue is you have massive amounts of um, childhood uh, death. So the high infant mortality rates, if, if people's babies aren't dying, if they can assume for sure that they're gonna live and then invest in them, they won't have as, much, they won't have as many babies and they also have to be able to have the means to control um, birth rates. So women have to be empowered with, with the means to control their own reproductive cycles. So again, uh, on the capping the economic disparities, of course, increase renewables, public transportation, um, that's, that's a given also. But then finally, reforest, reforest, reforest. So climate change is gonna take us out. Again, reforesting is what we have. It's the lungs of the globe. Also the lungs of the globe is the ocean. Again, I'm not the aquatic expert, but we, we um, are getting rid of animal agriculture. So that includes fish. So that's gonna help the oxygen um, abilities of the ocean as well. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Um, no, I don't. I agree with that, and I think it's important to incentivize those kinds of behaviors. Incentivize through taxing policy uh, behaviors that don't cause harm, like our current system does. You know, right now we're incentivizing overproduction of grain, overproduction of dairy, and then the government buys 20 million pounds of excess cheese to feed to kids, and the amount of cow's milk people are drinking in the US has actually been going down. But if they can make cheese out of that cow's milk, they can still use a lot of it. And so the government has incentivized this massive production and then it pushes it out uh, through these nutrition programs. So, and then there are external costs associated with that that are not counted for, you know, heart disease and, and the health problems that come from eating too many animal foods. So if we just stopped subsidizing a messed up system that causes so much harm, that depletes resources, destroys forests, um, acidifies the oceans. Um, I think we would see a big shift. I think we also need to look at like agricultural taxes. You know, right now ranchers, for example, get tax breaks and they get tax money to go kill those wolves, you know, out west when they shouldn't be. So this is another example of where we're spending money on something that is doesn't make sense. It's, it's helpful for a very small number of individuals, these two ranchers, for example, um, and causing harm to the environment, to animals, and to the common wealth, the common good. So I think the ideal scenario would be small, community-oriented, plant-based agriculture, um, in many cases women, growing food in communities, uh, and just community-based agriculture, where, for instance, somebody would be growing maybe apples, their neighbor would be growing peaches, and then they would share. <laughs> That's a nice thing about th that kind of a system, is that the earth can be so abundant, and when people are living in this way and not afraid of scarcity, and I really like the idea of food as a right, not as sort of a profit thing. I also like the idea of health care as a right, not something that you're afraid of and not getting. So making it so people are safe and cared for is the ideal. Um, how do we get there? I think we just start, d stop incentivizing irresponsible behavior. That's sort of the first step, and that's through the whole farm bill and the subsidy system. And one thing I'll say too about exports is we also have an export enhancement program where there's federal money that goes into promoting uh, U.S. animal foods around the world. So that's another example of a subsidy that is promoting unhealthy practices here and pushing them around the world. 
And um, I think China does present us with a very interesting and I think positive example of trying to rein in our own human irresponsible behavior and acting rationally, ultimately. Um, they say it's good to be king. So if I were king, I would uh, introduce five things and they may not all be legal, they may not all be democratic or constitutional, but this is what I would do if I were dictator and I could just say this is the way it's gonna be. <laughs> to reduce meat consumption in this country, number one, a meat tax. We don't tax food, but we could tax meat. We could make it more expensive, less desirable. We could take that money from those um, taxes, not only subsidize fruits and vegetables, but use it for point number two, which would be direct consumer education. You have to go through an education program. You have to take classes if you're going shopping for food for your family. Uh, you teach whoever it is, the mother, the father, the oldest child, whoever goes shopping, so that they are completely aware of the consequences of their purchases. You could even have direct consumer education in the supermarket. Show pictures of those chickens in those battery cages. This is where your eggs come from. If that was required, guess what? People would not buy those eggs, or they would buy them a lot less. Because if anybody's seen a battery cage, it's one of the most disgusting things you've ever seen. Even things like cookbooks. I mean, people just don't even know how to cook vegetarian food or vegan food. And it's a really practical sort of street level thing, but maybe we should have mandatory classes in how to cook vegetarian. Um, people think of it as bland and unattractive and my family's not gonna eat it, but I've had some excellent food that didn't have a piece of meat in it, obviously. Um, one cuisine that comes to mind is Middle Eastern cuisine. I've spent a lot of time in the Middle East. It's absolutely the best food in the world and it's virtually all vegetarian or, or a lot of it is. Um, then I would um, take money out of policy making as much as I could. Certainly I think a lot of people would agree that Citizens United is something that probably should go. Now that's putting money into political campaigns, but I would also put a cap on lobbying. So that Archer Daniels Midland or Cargill or the Farm Bureau could only spend X number of dollars every year in lobbying politicians. Now that's the most problematic because I'm very much in favor of the First Amendment and I do believe in free speech and I think that's attached. Free speech is the same as, I mean money, I mean, it's a very conservative position but I, I do have a libertarian streak in me as well and, and I think that you know spending money is kind of equivalent to speaking freely. But why not put a cap on the amount of lobbying that goes into supporting things like subsidies um, for, for meat producers. Uh, number four, I would require every household to become a net producer of food, whether it's on your rooftop, in your garden, or in a community garden. Because A, if you raise that food, you're gonna be far more likely to eat it, and you have ownership of it, and you know where it came from, and you've put in blood, sweat, and tears to make it happen. So if you grow your own vegetables, you're gonna eat your own vegetables, and you're gonna eat a lot more vegetables. Listen to me, you're gonna eat your vegetables. <laughs> and um, then fifthly, um, I, I think um, health warnings. We, we should have packages uh, with what meat, what cholesterol, what pesticides, antibiotics, all the things that come in uh, to our bodies from consuming these products can do to us. Explicit, um, grotesque even. I was in Canada a little while ago and I was just literally shocked by the cigarette packs. They show pictures of a, of a lung with cancer. Um, they show, it's, it's graphic and it's disturbing and it makes you never want to smoke a cigarette again in your life. So why not show pictures of what overconsumption of animal products can do to people? Uh, again, none of these things are gonna happen, um, unfortunately, but if, if I could make things happen, if I were to choose five things, those would be the five things I do. Um, if each of you would make a closing three-minute statement summarizing anything that you feel is important to some close with. Okay, anyone could start wherever you want. Say, I would just say that um, you know, these issues can be massive and seem like they're untouchable, but the good news is that each of us every day makes choices about what's on our plate 
and those choices can have profound impacts on our own health, on the earth, and on other animals. And you know, the best thing to do is to go vegan, to eat no animal products at all. For those of you who are not vegan, start slowly and go as quickly as you can. <laughs> but you can be empowered to take steps, you know, as opposed to looking at it and saying, oh, it's hopeless, because it can feel that way sometimes. Look at what you can do, start, and then continue. So look at what you can do and embrace it and start taking steps. All right, I'll go. So I've been working on a concept with some other social justice activists. So it's not really uh, fully out there yet, but I'm gonna go ahead and, and run it by you and maybe you have some thoughts and we can discuss it later. But it's the, the concept of a vegan ally and so whether you're vegan or not vegan, there are things that you can do to support veganism if you believe in the value system. And so if you believe what veganism is about, but you're just not there yet for whatever reason, because it, it, it can be difficult, there's a lot of emotion tied to it, there's a lot of social pressures around it, and so whatever the reasons are, but if you say, yeah, I get, I get it. So for example, I get public transportation and why that's so important, but I still drive more than I would like. Um, as much as I just said I would get rid of vegan tiramisu, I am a chocoholic. I would like to not eat so much chocolate, but I still do because I, I haven't worked through that. So my ideal and my actions are not aligned. And so what I would like to encourage people to do is to be sure that you don't shift your values and ideals to match your actions, to sit in that discomfort a little bit and let that be okay and just acknowledge, you know what, it would be better if I didn't eat processed foods or if I ate more vegan foods. This, this cheese is not great. It is causing greenhouse gases. I'm still eating it because cheese is actually fairly addictive. It was, it's the hardest to quit um, in going vegan. Somebody said bacon's the hardest. It's not. It's cheese. But, but so <laughs> yeah, obviously they were not vegan. <laughs> it's cheese. Um, but so even if your actions aren't matching up, just know that you can do things like, first off, be friendly to vegans. Don't be defensive. We actually have to deal with that quite a bit. Like it can, you know, it, it's something that we can, uh, have to just deal with the stress socially of people being defensive around us, even if we are being nice. Um, so uh, have vegan options available. Buy vegan options sometimes, just increasing consumer demand, even if you're not vegan, the more vegan products being bought, it helps other people. It creates a social structure that's it's sympathetic towards it and that's friendly towards it and it creates actual demand that will reduce prices and, and bring in tipping points and things of that nature. So even if you're not vegan, there's lots of things you can do to support that. And again, just to go ahead and be brave and be in the discomfort of, I'm not there yet, but I do agree with it and I want to help in my way. So I would never vote against public transportation. You know, I'm, I'm in favor of public transportation even if I'm not there yet. So uh, the same kind of thing is not to bring your values to match your actions. Try to let your values pull up your actions and even if it's imperfect to, to work through that. Now, I'm going to say something that might seem a little contradictory. So we talked about um, uh, not saying uh, David didn't want to say meat was bad. I think something to that nature. I will say it's bad. Um, <laughs> meat is bad. Killing animals is bad. Um, but the people, people aren't. The, it's not that the people are bad, but it's a bad system. And um, in Circles of Compassion, Will Tuttle's uh, anthology, I have an essay called Hunger, Meat, and the Banality of Evil. And again, it's not that the people are evil, but there's a normalization of atrocities. And it's not my concept, it's Hannah Arendt's uh, concept that I'm applying. And it's hunger, meat, and the banality of evil in circles of compassion. And I'm just so grateful to be here. This has been a wonderful panel. And uh, again, thank you all, and uh, thank you. Next. Earlier this year, I, I posted something on my, my website. I think it's, uh, it's about climate change. Um, and I've spoken quite a bit about climate change here today and in my presentation yesterday. But uh, I wrote something that I concluded to myself that I thought it was the best thing I ever wrote. And I, I tried to make it read like a scientific paper, sort of, and I 
And I kind of started it off with credits to Robert Goodland and Jeff Anhang, who I'd mentioned earlier. Jeff was his co-researcher at the World Bank. Uh, I never met Robert in person, but I did attend his uh, memorial service in Washington in the spring of 2014, where I met Jeff Anhang and, and have corresponded with him quite a bit. But uh, I, I credit both of those guys with, with my getting kind of on the climate change bandwagon. Uh, so yesterday uh, in my presentation, I, I posted and ran a, ran a three-minute silent movie of a, of a pump handle graph. And uh, I wanted to share that with you just to tell you how to find it. If you go to my website, which is hpjmh, five letters, hpjmh.com, and I, right at the top of that website, you'll see my, all of my slides that I used yesterday. And then you'll see the movie. And you gotta carefully look at that thing, but it's called the Pump Handle 2014. It's a graph by NOAA. And it's just amazing, and it helps, helps people that are maybe climate change deniers or people that want to explain climate change, but it's totally data-driven, data and it's three, three minutes and a half or so. And right below that, that is a link to the, my 12-point paper on climate change that I posted here on April 23rd. So I think that's what I want to leave you with. I, I think climate change is the number one issue. I think um, the number one thing we have to do is figure out a way to get the world to shift to a whole food, plant-based diet and do that as quickly as possible. So that's my thoughts. Thanks for um, including me on this panel. I, I guess I would just end with a point that I'd, I'd stressed before. I think that it's, it's really important to uh, figure out ways of, of uh, communicating these issues with people who are concerned, um, obviously with animal uh, suffering and well-being, uh, people who are concerned about climate change, um, the loss of biodiversity, but people also who are broadly engaged in social struggles, social justice, um, and, and, why, and communicating why this is such a momentous issue. And I think it's, it's important to try and embed uh, industrial I issues surrounding industrial livestock and dietary change in, a, in, in very broad ranging, as, as a central part of broad ranging struggles for a more equitable, uh, sustainable, uh, and humane world world and so I think w where do we begin is, is a huge question there's so many different so many challenges um, that um, that for, for so many people that it's just an unconscious part of everyday life uh, you know, as you, Donna mentioned this banality of evil I talk about it as the violence of everyday life um, it, the suffering that that we are or people on this panel but many people are just so so um, intimately connected to animal lives in many ways, consuming the, the bodies of, of animals who have suffered intensely, and yet so distant from those animals in their, in their consciousness. And I think um, that, that's a, it's a really hard thing to, to, to break down some of that unconsciousness. There's a case that's unfolding right now in my neck of the woods in Ontario uh, that's got a fair bit of international attention. I don't know if it's received much in the United States, but it's a a woman um, who is giving water to some pigs on the way to a slaughterhouse. And she, it, Canada has horrible farm transport welfare laws and um, it basically it, it, it began as a movement about five years ago of this, these pigs coming to slaughter in this uh, packed into a truck and suffering of, of dehydration and intense heat. Uh, after a long transport to you know, increasingly centralized slaughter, so they're moving over further distances. And so she and others began a movement of giving water to pig as, uh, these pigs as a bearing witness to the suffering and a bearing witness to this kind of invisibility in our, in our world. And she, the movement grew. It's now there are some groups in the U.S., there are some groups in the U.K., uh, and her move, the, the pig save movement has grown within Canada. And last year she got charged for um, 
of basically uh, criminal trust that the, tra the charge is trespass, and they're trying to shut her up by intimidating her. It's criminal trespass. And what is the basis of the criminal trespass charge? It's, it's uh, damage to property, and that property, the, the, the alleged damage is the property uh, to, to the pigs, uh, even though the pigs were still slaughtered. And so it's, a char it's, a, it's something that's unfolding right now, and I, I just raised that as, as an example of, of a really uh, dedicated, passionate person who's trying to prick that unconsciousness in, in a really, I think, a very powerful kind of act of civil disobedience. And the trial's unfolding, you can follow it in the news. It's got, as I said, I don't know if it's in the US news media, but it's been in the British news media and Canada's got a, a fair bit of coverage to it. But I think it speaks to the, you know, the challenge of how, how do we burst the, the, un the unconscious that surrounds us everyday violence or the banality of evil. And I think part of that challenge rests with building bridges to people who are broadly concerned about environment, climate, biodiversity, and, and social justice as well. Oh, and there's a big Facebook movement around it, I guess. So. Yeah. <laughs> Not a Facebook fun. person. <laughs> Uh, the, the check pig, if you pig do re any research on pig save or just and type Anita. in pig save and, and the name's Anita, it's on the track. Congratulations, everyone. <laughs> uh, I think I'd like to. Uh, just summarize by saying that uh, once again thank you for this opportunity I think that's uh, the most important thing is education and enlightenment and to gather uh, as many people as possible in the movement towards uh, especially with with the the uh, topic that I am most involved with with sustainability in our environment I'm going to say we need to uh, I'm going to conclude by saying that we need to begin with the precept that uh, understanding the precept that we're we're in a state of unsustainability and uh, and there's no greater issue that faces us then than that of our connection to our environment and as I said before in in summary that you know we it's very important to take control of your own life and and seek those measures that make you and your family and those around you more health or healthier as an individual. Uh, but it, it won't matter how healthy you are if our planet isn't healthy. And I think that we also need to keep in mind the, the inner connection that we have with all other species on Earth that we share this planet with and, 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 and our future generations. And we happen to be in a very unique situation or a very unique position in the history of, of mankind or womankind or humankind. And that is that uh, we are at a, at a crossroads where the generations living today that are in somewhat of a leadership position can make or break humanity. And that's not a gross overstatement. Uh, it's just, it happens to be the reality of things. And so I, I think that it, it, it's an, in, inherent upon all of us then to uh, continue seeking as much information as possible, as become educated as much as possible, seek the right definitions of what sustainability and environment, and in terms of food choice and the connection to our environment, seek out the, um, as much as you can about, uh, become educated as much as you can, and then, and then uh, be an advocate. Uh, every five years, the US Dietary Guidelines, for instance, are, 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 are document, are, positioned or stated. And this year happened to be the first time, in, or actually last year, uh, when uh, the advisory committee, it was the first time the advisory committee uh, has had stated that, that the environment should be positioned somewhere in the uh, dietary guidelines, which uh, undermined, of course, the uh, meat and dairy and fishing industries. So this is one of those issues that, uh, it, 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 even though the advisory committee uh, promoted uh, the inclusion of, um, of reducing, if not eliminating, meat, dairy, and fish, uh, it never got, uh, it was never printed. And so, but it's the beginning, it's the first step. So I think that that's a good example of uh, where we need to go with policy making. I think educate yourself, educate those around you, and do what you can uh, to understand this, this nexus of 
the environment and food choice and sustainability and the connectedness that we have to all other species, as I said, and also even though, again, uh, climate change is the most, uh, has the most uh, notoriety, it's only one of many of the tipping points that face us and many of the tipping points are, will happen irrespective of climate change. So uh, understand that and, and appreciate that you can do, all do something about this because the thread that weaves its way through all these areas of unsustainability it can be found in your plates. And the, the quicker you can reduce and eliminate uh, animal agriculture from those products that end up on your plate, the, uh, the easier we'll and the more quickly we'll find our ways on a state of, uh, towards a path of sustainability. You'll do it for yourselves, you'll do it for those around you, and you'll do it for all inhabitants on earth. So thank you for being part of this tremendous event. And uh, by being here, you uh, are already on the right path. So congratulations and welcome aboard. Just going to quickly um, end with a little bit of devil's advocacy here. That may not surprise you. Um, and really, it's more questions than statements. But, you know, agriculture has been with us for, I think, around 10,000 years or more since we became civilized. That's both crops and animal agriculture. I, I think it is part of who we are. It's part of what has made us what we are. So. I'm just wondering a world without any animal agriculture whatsoever and how that might work. And um, uh, for example, then I suppose, and, and I'm not saying this is a good or bad thing, these are just sort of questions. If we were all to stop eating animal products immediately tomorrow, I guess domestic pigs, chickens, and cows would go extinct, right? Unless we kept a few around in, in zoos, just to remember. There could be like wild you know, populations, but the mass-produced ones would, the only reason they exist is because we mass-produce and they can't even reproduce naturally sometimes. So, right. So certain species, yes, probably would. Okay. And it, it would also, it would, if we were really going to do it, it, it would happen gradually, hopefully it would happen gradually quickly, but we just stop producing, we stop producing them and then sanctuaries, not zoos. Sanctuaries, yes, yeah. thank you. <laughs> I'm all for sanctuaries. It's also important to remember for most of the history of agriculture, we've been, there's been a few hundred million people on earth, not seven billion going on nine to 10 billion. No, absolutely, yeah. I know. And I'm, I'm just, again, I'm, I'm just raising some contentious Can I help you with one points. Thing? Uh, sorry. Let me help. I guess I'm going to uh, real quickly expound just slightly on, on what uh, Tony just said. Uh, you, David, are you familiar with uh, the island, island of Tacopia? or some of the other, Tacopia, yeah, no. okay. All right, so very quickly, and without going into a lot of detail, uh, it's an enclosed uh, uh, environment, sustainability, in terms of sustainability, similar to what I, the, the uh, model that I provided or discussed with Hawaii. So about in the year 1400, 1500, and I apologize if it's not an exact year, but um, they decided they were, they were raising pigs. And they, uh, they had maybe eight kings at the time. You were talking about dictators. They had eight dictators at the time. And they realized that um, their little subsistence fishing uh, could continue in the reef systems uh, because at that time they weren't um, inundated with uh, ships from, you know, trawling ships from China and Japan um, in their waters. But they also realized that pigs, domesticated pigs, and uh, their animal agriculture essentially on their island was not sustainable. So whereas there are some other civilizations throughout history that we don't have to um, uh, go into right now that, did, that didn't um, survive, they didn't make it because they, one reason or another, um, there are many of them that, that uh, had a sustainability issue. They, uh, they, uh, they stripped away their environment at a quicker rate than what could sustain them. Well, Tacopia made the decision to do away with uh, all of their uh, pigs. I don't know if exactly, I wasn't there in 1400, but you know, if they had one big, big uh, uh, roast, or they let them all live until they uh, died naturally, uh, the point to that is, is that they realized that they had an enclosed earth on their island, and there they had an overpopulation. They had to do something about their food systems because their agricultural systems uh, were not sustainable. So they made the right decisions, and they still have they have a, a human population today uh, because of that. So anyway, just a, just a quick example of, of uh, you know, it's difficult to project exactly what would happen, but we know what we should do. And so I think it's how, what 
steps have to take place to make that happen, rather than saying it doesn't make sense to to um, do away with all the domesticated animals all at once. I think it's a matter of just taking the steps to do what's correct, and uh, things will things will play out. October 13th, 1994, New York Times. A two-year project to decommission the $5.5 billion Shoreham nuclear power plant is finished and all radioactive material has been removed. Richard M. Kessel, the chairman of the Long Island Power Authority, said today. Construction of Shoreham began in 1973. The plant was nearly completed by 1984, but public opposition to its opening and a lengthy dispute between the company and estate and Suffolk County officials over emergency evacuation plans delayed the issuance of a federal operating until April 1989. Um, the project, the first in the nation to dismantle a licensed commercial nuclear reactor, cost several million dollars less than the 186 million projected. So how did they, how many tens of thousands of people did they get to march to fight this, to dismantle this? 10, 20, 100,000 people. How many people did they have to get to be the first in the nation to dismantle a licensed commercial nuclear reactor? It was six people. Six people were fighting it, protesting it, and yes, there were people that joined them to protest, but it was basically a group of six people that brought it down. I hope that through this conference, in this audience, and the people watching around the world, whoever you are, that you know that you don't need to be a, a, everyone. You have the power, you and five other people, hear this message, do what you can, use all your resources, don't assume someone else's, handling this or heard this or is responsible. Don't assume someone's smarter or more scientific. You have more than enough information. You were counting on you to somehow take this from here and move it forward. Thank you for coming.